we left off talking about the carbon and the nitrogen cycles, which are very important biogeochemical cycles. There's other cycles, there's tons of them, tons of biogeochemical cycles that we have atoms that go from the non-living portions of the environment to the living and back and forth. So just to mention a couple other important cycles, phosphorus. Phosphorus is also an important component of DNA, RNA, and proteins. Phosphorus is interesting because it doesn't have an atmospheric component. It is in rocks. What page is it? Uh, what page, y'all? <laughs> Thank you. Phosphorus is found in rocks. So rocks and soil are important because rocks themselves leach nutrients into soil. So sometimes we don't think about that as an important thing. Um, like when I garden, if I have plants at home, I always, in the bottom of a pot, I put rocks in the bottom. It does a couple things. One is I know rocks have a lot of important atoms to give to the plant, but also makes like um, space between the rocks. So it helps to aerate, allows air into the soil as well, which helps with soil, with plant health. So rocks are an important component as well. Phosphorus gets dissolved from the rocks into the soil and then gets taken up through the roots of plants with water and other nutrients coming in. It's passed through the trophic levels. Then when all of the living things, the autotrophs, the heterotrophs, or the primary producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary, quaternary, all of the consumers die, as well as the producers die, the last bits of energy in them gets taken up by the detritivores and the decomposers. Waste of all of those organisms gets taken up by the detritivores and decomposers, and the atoms are recycled, or the nutrients are recycled back into the soil, and then made available again through rocks or through soil to the autotrophs, plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. And as I mentioned, phosphorus important component of DNA and RNA, how we are organized and constructed, tells us how our DNA and RNA says how we look, how our internal physiology is, and how our behaviors are. So a lot of those, what we talked about counteracting behaviors are based in, right here in our DNA and RNA. So little things like one atom, like phosphorus, if we have a lack of that, can really disrupt organisms. Water. Water is important for so many different reasons. We call water the hydrological cycle. Hydro, this beginning part, hydro, means water. So if you ever see hydro somewhere, it's referring to water. Water is really important for how atoms and molecules are made, come together, or break down. So if you're dehydrated, what that does is it slows down your metabolism. Your metabolism is all the biochemical reactions in your cells. And so if you don't have enough water, you can't make and break the molecules within your cells. So everything, all those chemical reactions slow down. Water is driven by solar energy, heat. Heat will take water up into the atmosphere, drives evaporation, and then when the clouds get full, drives precipitation. And so we get that up and down of water. So that's just to mention some of the nutrient cycles that are important or the cycles of atoms in our ecosystems. So as a recap, remember, Nutrients, the atoms, the carbons, the hydrogens, the nitrogens, the phosphorus, all of the different kinds of atoms that are important. Water. Those things are recycled. They go through, they get taken in from the ground or the atmosphere into the autotrophs or the producers, the plants, the algae, and the cyanobacteria. Those things get eaten, pass through the trophic levels, 
the waste of all the organisms, as well as the dead bodies or cells, the atoms get recycled, the energy gets used by the detritivores and the decomposers. But then the cycle has to start again and it's driven by energy. The way that the atoms come together are in bonds. Bonds are energy. Energy has to keep being remade. We need renewable sources of energy like sunlight. Sunlight's a big driver in creating food for the trophic levels, past, passes that energy and those nutrients for the trophic levels, and then to the detritivores and the decomposers, which can bring the nutrients back into the system, but energy has to be remade or has to take those atoms that were broken apart and bring them back together to cycle through. So what do you think? Are humans messing up all of these biogeochemical cycles? Oh, those humans, right? Of course they are. So we interfere in many, many, many ways. Our reliance on fuels, specifically, we have a society that relies on fossil fuels. Fossil means dead or ancient organism. Oh, you have a question. Oh, sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Farmers often include, oh, you guys have this. I took it out. I didn't take it out of there. Uh, farmers often include legumes or beans as a part of their normal crop ro rotation. This increases the overall production of their crops by, and we didn't talk about this. That's why I, I took it out, but I didn't take it out in your notes. But does anybody know anything about like crops like for example we grow a lot of corn in illinois so one of the things that the corn growers will do is they'll take a bean and put it like let's say they have four plots here and they'll put the beans here but they grow the corn and the other three but they make most of their money off of the corn the point of having the beans or the legumes is that they do a service for the soil. So they have, if you remember a little bit about nitrifying bacteria, what those bacteria do is they grab nitrogen because nitrogen can't be taken in by us, even though nitrogen is about 79% of the atmospheric component. It, we, can't breathe, we can breathe it in, but we can't fix it or attach it into our cells. So what happens is, is that you have these bacteria in soil that can fix or grab onto the nitrogen and then they pass it over to the producers and the producers take up that nitrogen and then that nitrogen becomes important parts of DNA, RNA and proteins. And then in our food, the nitrogens are passed. So uh, nitrifying or the, it, it's the nitrogen one, adding nitrogen to the soil, A, is the answer. So back to that, one of the things that will happen is that you want especially nitrogen to be a rich source or an element, a nutrient in your corn if you're that corn farmer. And so they put beans here in this plot and then they grow their corn. And then the next year, what they do is they move the bean plot over here. And what they've done in that last year is they've nitrified that soil. So they've added nitrogen by using the beans. And so every year they move that bean plot around so that, and then they move the crop. So that's what, when, if you've heard that term crop rotation, that's what they're doing is they're using some kind of nitrifying plant like a legume or a bean to put nitrogen into the soil so that then the thing that they're getting all their money from gets that rich nitrogen source the next year or the following year. So just a little bit of real world activity. Thank you again for letting me know. So what fault that we're having right now is that humans are relying on fossil fuels for the majority of our energy, but we need a sustainable source. And the thing about fossil fuels is this term fossil means that it is the remnants of an old or ancient organism, a fossil, something that lived at one point, 
died and then the last bits of their body go into the ground. And when the fossils get compressed over time, they can turn into one of three main things, which is coal, um, oil, or natural gas. And those are our fossil fuels. And those all come from old dead things. We only have so many things that have lived on the earth before us. So that means that fossil fuels are not renewable, that we could run out of them. And we have seen in some areas of the world of them, like a country that might live off an oil reserve and they've used so much of it that it's running low now. So then what do they do? They have to find some other way, way to get fuel. And so then that's where things get political in the world. They're gonna buy from this one or trade for this and that gets very complicated. But we should really be looking at renewable sources of energy like sun, wind, water. And we talked about some of those other ways like the 90, the 90 percent of energy that's lost is heat. If we could figure out how to capture that, that would be another important renewable form of energy. Um, let me go back to this one and that one. So also fueling our industries with fossil fuels that when we do these use it, when we use fossil fuels, it gives off extra carbon dioxide. When you burn a living thing, it gives off carbon dioxide. We know that carbon dioxide fuels climate change and different processes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Also, an in industry of producing just stuff can give off toxins or extra nutrients into the air. Like we might not want so much nitrogen extra nitrogen in the air or sulfur in the air because when they combine with oxygen they make nitric acid and sulfuric acid which we'll get into that in a little bit too and from the things that go into the atmosphere from our industrial processes they can between precipitation and evaporation they can come down and get into our soil but also agricultural processes any chemicals that we might put on plants to deter weeds from growing in an area, those chemicals can be very dangerous to us, as well as the things we eat, and then we eat and we get those chemicals in our bodies. Okay, so a little bit about these terms, global warming and climate change. We're hearing less and less about global warming. Global warming was something that was an idea back in the probably like 1950s where people had started to notice that it was getting warmer in areas of the world. And so people started calling it global warming. That was one of the first things of climate change that was very noticeable, that some areas were just way warmer than they, used, they were in the past. Global warming has been used as like a a lot in politics. So like for example, if, um, if there's an area in the United States that gets just a ton of snow, some politicians will say, oh yeah, global warming, look at all that snow, ha ha ha, global warming. But actually they're supporting what's happening because what may have happened like in the Chicagoland area in January and February, we would have a lot of days that were like close to zero, maybe between zero and 20 in January and February. And as our area is getting warmer over time, so between, if we look at temperatures, so if we used to have temperatures that were, let's say, 20 to zero. In these areas, are we really getting snow? No, snow doesn't fall typically in this range. It's too cold. The snow gets locked up. But as the temperature is getting warmer, what can happen in a lot of areas of the world is that where these were typical for two of the four months of winter, now we're seeing kind of like a variance between even some negative numbers and 
up through about 32 degrees. Usually in the 30s, you can get snow. So in some areas of the world, you are seeing more snow, which does support that there's warming that's happening. So it's always interesting when people are like, no, you get all this snow, yeah, global warming. It's like, well, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. So the other thing that, about global warming is that it gave the idea that the Earth was warming at the same rate. And there um, was a study done, and I think it was in Greenland, um, that it showed that areas of that little small part of the world were getting colder. And so then a lot of politicians would go, oh no, there's a study that says that this, this is getting colder. See, global warming's not true. It's like, well, actually it's not, quite global warming because heat's being taken from there and going somewhere else and warming because of air and water currents that that actually does support global warming but you also in a in combination with global warming you have to take into account that things move in the world so the earth isn't warming at an equal rate everywhere it's different and what they got settled on was kind of more recent terms. We talk about climate change, that because water, um, cold air, cold water shifts, that some, you might see a small area that has gotten colder, but you'll see other areas that have gotten increasingly warmer. And so because of water and air circulation, things change drastically, that you have areas where water goes away and you had water here and here, but now this one is dry and this one has tons of water. The water's still all there. It's just shifted in drastic amounts. You also see that with, you know, air temperatures. We, we've been getting, you know, what, two years ago, we had a whole month of negative temperatures. Like a whole month is not normal for us. So we are seeing shifts. Things are weird, things are happening. And that's the idea of climate change, that the climate is changing in almost every area of the world. You're seeing unusual events. So just a little background on that, because I know sometimes that can be like, confusing if you didn't know the difference between terms and why. The big driver of this is excess use of fuel that when we use so much fuel, we have so many people using fuel, that the burning of fossil fuels produces extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So our Earth, Earth is really unique in comparison to other planets and um, the distance from the sun makes it very opportune for living things to thrive. But we also have this bubble. We have an atmosphere that's like like we have this invisible bubble around us. And what that does is it allows sun to come in, heat to come in and stay. And it's made it warm enough. We just have these range of temperatures that made it, makes it just right, the distance from the sun, the atmosphere for living things to thrive in the temperatures that we have on earth. That bubble has been a really great thing over time. It's allowed living things to thrive, but the bubble also holds in extra carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide that we produce by fueling everything, our homes, our phones, our cars, etc. The extra carbon dioxide has led to more heat in our bubble. And heat is causing everything to kind of go wacky, right? The, the air, the air, um, the air circulation and the water circulation. And so when we have that extra temperature within there, the extra carbon dioxide leads to extra high temperatures and makes everything go awry. So in general, kind of like as a, it's not an average, but because of air and water circulation, we do know global, global temperatures are rising. They're just not rising at the same rate everywhere. And we are seeing shifts in what we know from 
like the 1900s. Things are very different in the 2000s. And again, that driver, carbon dioxide. We often call our atmospheric bubble, it's like a greenhouse. If you've ever been in a greenhouse, it's warmer in there. If you've gone to like a conservatory where they have plants, it's warmer. It, you go in and it feels warmer, it feels a little moister in there. And that's all because you have this kind of like glass area that's holding in the heat from the sun. It's also making water kind of shift. So it feels a little bit uh, moister in there. So our bubble is kind of like that. It acts like a greenhouse where it's holding all that nice heat and moisture in. Global temperatures rise, but they don't rise the same in every location. So let's take a look at the different drivers of climate change. So the sun is a driver. That's kind of our, our natural driver. But then we have other things that are going to add climate change gases. So carbon dioxide, like vehicle emissions, our cars, our power plants and factories, heating and cooling our homes, as well as using energy to fuel charging your phone, forest fires, volcanic activity, all of those things can add extra carbon dioxide. Another driver of climate change is agricultural activity and that adds methane. So one of the things about cows is that naturally cows, they feed on cellulose or grass, well, so you should say grass, which is full of cellulose. Cellulose is, uh, has a lot of bonds, a lot of covalent bonds, which are harder to break. And not only do they go like this and this and this between the sugars, the simple sugars that make up a complex carbohydrate called cellulose, but they also do these like cross bonds as well. And so you get this kind of mishmash of bonds between the simple sugars in the cellulose, and it makes it very difficult to access the energy and the sugars. So cows have a few strategies that they use. One is that they have bacteria in their stomach system that produce, the bacteria produce an enzyme called cellulase, which helps to break down the cellulose. So they have this symbiotic relationship there. The other thing that cows have is they have an enormous digestive system. When we get later in the semester into talking about the different biological systems, I like to look at animals of different kinds and show you that if you have a system in an animal that takes up a lot of space in their body, it should indicate to you something about that system needing a lot of space to do their function. So like think about us, our respiratory system, our lungs take up a lot of the top part of our body and our digestive system takes up the bottom trunk of our body. So those two systems are critically important, right? Breathing to get us oxygen that helps to break down our food. So we have that cellular respiration is like this much of our body and this much of our body. Cow's digestive system takes up the majority of their, their full body area, their trunk of their body. Cows have four stomachs. They have a four chambered stomach. So they have a huge amount of stomach. And what cows do is they're eating for about eight to 10 hours a day because they eat grass. That's it. Think about how big a cow is. They're eating grass. That's it. So if you were only eating grass to maintain that quite large size, maybe three, 400 pounds, you would have to be eating all the time. To try and get at that cellulose, they've got the bacteria and they've got a big stomach system and the stomachs can kind of crush and chemically try and get at it and add that cellulase from the bacteria. But cows also, they chew their food, they use their flat teeth, they have a lot of molars to crush. Food goes in, then food comes back up. They burp and they burp their food back into their mouth after it's been through the digestive process for a while and they re-chew it. Yeah. So imagine like you ate your food and it was in there for a couple hours and then you just like burped it back into your mouth and you chewed it again to give it another chance to get at that, those bonds, get that energy going. When the cows do that burping action, 
what it releases, it, it releases a gas called methane that is like a process, something that's made in the process of digesting their food. Methane does a very similar thing to carbon dioxide in terms of warming our atmosphere. It gets stuck in our bubble. So methane takes about 20, it's a, it accounts for about 25 to 30% of our climate change gas. So what's a solution to lowering climate change? Yeah, decreasing our cows, which means decreasing what? Decreasing what we eat. So there's a good case in lowering climate change by just not eating beef. But we never hear about that, right? Because we don't want to change too many things as humans. Another problem with combating climate change is deforestation. In areas that are really rich with producers, if we're cutting and cutting them down, we're getting rid of the very things that can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So we're kind of doing like a double whammy there. Oftentimes with deforestation, what they do is they don't just cut them down, cut down the trees and the plants, faster way of getting rid of all of that so that you can grow like pineapples or mangoes or one kind of what they call a monoculture. Take that and you're just gonna focus on growing one thing in the rainforest as you burn it down. And so when you burn living things, it adds extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So remember, all these different ways of adding carbon dioxide to our bubble, to our atmosphere, makes for higher temperatures in our bubble. Another thing that I want you to think about is the term climate change. Do we know of periods of history when we had great amounts of, we had ice ages, right? and then it was cooler, ice age cooler. That's climate change. So when people say climate change isn't happening, and I'm always like, oh, it's been happening for the history of Earth. The climate has always been changing. The problem is, is that humans are accelerating climate change to a point that we've never seen in the history of life. And so that's a big difference there. So it's just um, interesting when you hear these things go into politics um, people choose their words very carefully to confuse the general public. And then what we usually do as general public is that we just take these little snippets of information as fact without digging deeper and understanding. So I'm, I'm hoping there's like even like, I mean, not hoping, but I'm going to guess there's at least one fact today and just what I talked about that you were like, oh, huh, right? So if you, who are very smart college-bound people, might be learning just like these little fine-tuned important things, just think what people who aren't going into biology or taking this class, they don't know much except for just what's put out there strategically by our politicians. So again, we are seeing the most extremes in the history of life. And there's lots of data to support that. So pieces of data. So these are interesting. So even just looking at from like the 1960s to 2010, that what we've seen with our temperature, and, and here's like the other thing about climate change um, with global warming, is that when people looked at this, they were like, oh yeah, look, it got warmer, but then look, it got colder again. But then it got warmer and it got colder and it got warmer and it got colder. Because we have different cycles, like for example, there's an El Nino effect in our area of the world where the, um, you have a cycle of water and air that goes like this, but then during El Nino, you might get the two cycles that could, they go into two like this for a year. So these could be like El Nino effects where it comes back down. So it doesn't go perfectly like that. It will go up and it will go down and things happen. But 
what you should look at the overall trend is that it's going up. Now, if you take this graph and you put it on that one, that's carbon dioxide. The amount of, excuse me, the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide has risen. Do you think if you put that on top of that, they would go perfectly correlated? Or not perfectly, but correlated pretty well together? Yeah, so you can see there's a cause and effect here. And there you go. So this graph here goes back to the 1860s. And again, you can see carbon dioxide going up and global temperatures going up and down, but the trend is correlated. This is 10,000 years of data. So we can go back, I can show you probably a hundred different graphs that have different kinds of data, but show you that when we get to about the industrial revolution, so here this goes back 10,000 years. They get this data by taking soil cores and uh, ice cores. So they could take these long, tall poles and they put them in to the ground and then they pull out a core, they call it an ice core, for example, and it might be this thick. And then what they can do is different chemical processes to see how much carbon dioxide gets dissolved out of each section of the core and they can correlate those cores, the depth with time in the past and get this data. So there's all kinds of different data um, analyses out there. But here you can see different areas of the world and you have it going up over time when humans came about to be using tools and then our tool uses goes bonkers around the industrial revolution. And once we hit the industrial revolution and we really start figuring out how to utilize fossil fuels, then things go crazy. And here's another one. This one goes back 800,000 years. And you have those ups and downs. You might have cold, uh, sorry, warm, then cold, and you have those warm and cold periods go up and down, and then the Industrial Revolution, it goes higher than we've ever seen in the past. I have a question. Yeah. So where did the, that data come from if it was like 800,000 years ago? Um, I'm going to hypothesize that this was an ice core. I don't, I don't have the legend on there. I should have put them all on there. Um, this is from NASA. All of these came from reliable places. Uh, this one's from Berkeley, where they, um, the University of California, Berkeley, where there are a lot of climate scientists who are studying there. Uh, uh, this one, no, of course I didn't put the correlation or what they are, but um, it's probably uh, ice core, I would imagine. Okay, so here's some of the effects that we know, that the icebergs are melting. This is a big one that we hear about. More and more of these huge ice deposits that are solid over time are melting really quickly. With the melting of water that's been locked up, it's going to add to sea levels, make sea levels rise. I just read a few days ago that Insurance companies are pulling out of insuring people in Florida and other coastal areas. They're, they're like leaving the state because they don't want to keep paying for people's homes to be destroyed over and over again by hurricanes, for example. So now people are going to go, what do we do? Do they move? And there's a big discussion of for like the governors and the federal government, what do we do for people who live in these areas that are affected over and over and over again? Do we not rebuild? Do we not allow rebuilding? Or do we allow rebuilding with certain, like you have to build, rebuild in this way? But that costs money. And if the insurance company is no longer giving you money, then what do you do? So there's a lot of consequences, again, politically to all of this. So sea levels are going up. 
The other thing I want to mention about this sea levels rising is that there's more water available to fuel hurricanes. That water that's locked up in ice is now available to make bigger and stronger hurricanes. For wildlife, we're seeing that wildlife are not migrating through certain areas anymore. They're skipping their migrations. And so a lot of times what we find with these migrants is that they are keystone species, that as they go from one habitat to the next to make their way through their migration, they're leaving maybe just their feces behind that has a certain nutrient that helps a kind of tree there. And then if that nutrient isn't being received by the tree because the bird isn't coming anymore, then the tree dies. And then that can have an effect on the entire ecosystem. So we're seeing a lot of these seasonal migrators changing what they do. We're also seeing different animals and organisms are reproducing at different times of the year. And their reproductive reproduction at this time may again have an effect on other organisms as well. And we've talked about all these other things, which we'll get into more. We are definitely having changes in allergies, for example. If any of you have noticed, since maybe you were like a little kid, that maybe your allergies have gotten worse over time. I know for me, my nose is like constantly kind of running. I was never like that. So I definitely see some shift in those seasonal allergies that are more like, not even seasonal, I feel like all year long, I've kind of got this like congestion that's happening. There's a lot of reports of psychological issues that we're just nervous, we're angry, we're frustrated, we're sad, right? Hearing the news of all of these destructive things. And I mean, every week, every week it's like, give money to this, to these people here and to these people here and these people here. And it's like so disheartening because you want to help everybody, but we can't help everybody. So what do we do? So it definitely has the, it's having a mental effect on us as well. And in general, the loss of nature, it's really important to spend time in nature and the loss of nature can have very adverse psychological effects too. So the biggest thing is with climate change is weather patterns are changing. And it doesn't necessarily mean everything's warming or everything's cooling at the same rate. We have a lot of different things, right? We turn on the news, we hear all of these destructive patterns. This is a huge issue. They're calling them environmental or climate refugees that we're having people who are losing their home, their livelihood, and they're trying to like get out of the area that they're in with nothing. They have nothing. So what do we, what, how do we help everybody? What do we do? Here's some pictures of the glaciers. Um, this is Muir Glacier, 1941. This was all completely ice, now water. And here's another picture you can see. This is 2004. Uh, uh, oh, wait, let's see. Oh, 1941, 2004, 1976, 2003. That you can see the differences in these chunks of ice. They're gone, right? And that's a picture from before. Look at all this frozen glacier gone. And these are recent pictures from areas that have flooded. The mudslides in California. Can you imagine just like standing there and watching your whole house just slide away? And these are the expensive ones. Like this, I just wanted to show that these are like people that can probably afford to move. But what about the people who can't? What about the people who have a modest home and live a modest life? They're probably not as lucky as these folks here. This is Maui. So this was Maui before the fire, and this is Maui after the fire. Oh, it's like, sorry, it's such a depressing, it's a depressing day 
we have more things. But hopefully the next lecture we'll talk about solutions. So let's take a look. We're going to look at different ecosystems of the world. OK, so well, I'm sorry. We're going to keep on with some depressing things. Deterioration of the ozone. Actually, there's a little positive news about this. I read last week that the ozone layer has been recovering. So something is changing. So a little background on that. Uh, part of our atmospheric bubble is that it we have an ozone layer. So not only do we have like a bubble that holds in heat, but we have this other bubble, the ozone layer, that filters out harmful UV rays. So we need our sunlight. Sunlight is important for helping us to metabolize or produce vitamin D. So here's a case for, I had a student a couple years ago, he said every day he gets up in the morning and he goes for a 20 minute walk, sets his timer. He gets up and right away goes outside, doesn't wear sunglasses because he read a study that said that the absorption of sun, even though we know that it too much can be harmful, that like 20 minutes of that in the morning actually gets you going. It gets your like melatonin levels to come down and it gets your serotonin norepinephrine to go up. And so there are like natural ways to cycle that kind of energy and also like good feelings as those kind of neurotransmitters help us to not be so depressed. So that's, you know, if you could think about something that would really mentally help you is go for that walk in the morning. That was like, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. He was super into like reading all these studies. And I was like, oh, so now, like when I walk my dog in the morning, I don't wear my sunglasses and we do like 20 minutes. So I was like, oh, and it, it does help. It makes you feel like, okay, I did a little something productive in the morning for my health. So we need a little bit of that. But too much UV can damage our biological molecules. And so things that we're talking about are like skin, we're seeing rises in melanoma. Definitely like sunburns, you can get sunburns so easily nowadays. And cataracts. People that work outside are developing cataracts in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Cataracts are typically like old people get cataracts, like really old people. But now we're seeing younger and younger people getting cataracts because they're working outside, they're not wearing protective sunglasses and hats, and um, we're seeing these diseases of like melanoma and cataracts go up. The most severe decline is over the Antarctica. It was at its highest about a 40% decline. This hole, so the hole kind of morphs depending on wind and water circulation around the world. So the hole kind of opens and closes, but they're finding that it's getting smaller and smaller, that it's actually decreasing. So yay, that's such a good thing. There's about a three to 4% decline in the ozone around the world in general. All right, so what causes destruction of the ozone layer? Chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. CFCs are a metal metabolic product of making refrigerants, foam plastics like styrofoam, other kinds of plastics, aerosols. Aerosols are in our country are made differently in a lot of other countries as well. So it's not the CFC producing aerosols. They're made differently nowadays and any kind of like plastic foam. So like I mentioned styrofoam. And same thing with like coolants, like refrigerator and air conditioner coolants are made differently, so they're not releasing CFCs anymore. CFCs break down O3, ozone is um, three oxygens covalently bonded together, and they can break it down into O2, but we, we don't need more O2, and if we did need more O2, this isn't the way we want to get it. So in 1985, a bunch of developed countries had got together and they were like, let's start eliminating the ways that we make like coolants and foam plastics, uh, aerosols. 
so that we're not producing CFCs because we know that's gonna have a long-term effect. Here's the other crazy thing, is that a CFC, when a CFC is produced, it takes, it goes really slow up into the atmosphere. So getting up to the ozone layer, it takes 50 to 100 years for a CFC to get there. So we are still seeing effects from 50 to 100 years ago right now. And what happened 30 years ago, we're gonna see still into the future. But this had a good impact on the way that we're doing things. Problem is, is that in the mid 80s, the countries that got together made that pact, but newly developing countries, they didn't sign that pact. So they're doing things kind of the old way but a lot of them are getting on board with, well, that's dumb, because this, why don't we just do it this other way that has the same outcome? So while many developing countries may still give off CFCs, a lot of them are getting on board with doing them the way that we'll emit the CFCs. Uh, tropical rainforest. So I mentioned that problem of monoculture, that what happens is, is that there's companies, like I just always like to use pineapples, that companies will go down to South America and they'll buy up a whole bunch of acres of rainforest and then they burn it. And the idea was when people first started doing this, they thought, well, if we burn all these living things, all of the nutrients, the atoms in their body, they're going to go into the soil and they're gonna produce this really rich soil. But that soil gets used really, really quickly. So in like five or six years, their pineapples, they get tons and tons of them, and then the yield is going down and down and down. Uh, the other thing that they were thinking was that in a rainforest, because it is so biodiverse, that the soil itself should be very rich. But there's so many organisms in a rainforest that when a decomposer and a detritivore put the nutrients into the soil, from a dead thing or waste, some organism sucks it up right away. So while you might think that rainforest soil is very rich, it's actually not at all, because there's so many species fighting for all of those nutrients. And so after a while, they were like, actually, this doesn't work really well, but whatever, we're making money, that's fine. So we still have companies that are still going in and buying land and burning down the rainforest. The rainforests have one of the highest biodiversities of any ecosystem in the world. So again, just to reiterate that the nutrients are really held in what we call the biomass. There's that BIO, and mass meaning like the bodies or the cells of organisms that they're taking it up. It gets passed very quickly through the trophic levels and then recycled by the DNDs, the detritivores and the decomposers. And the cycling happens so quick that not much is left in the soil itself. So it's believed that at least one third of the rainforest is gone already. We're thinking maybe even up to 40 plus percent is already gone. It's also believed that the destruction of the rainforest may be driving 50,000 species a year to go extinct. Another issue, acid rain. Sorry. Okay, so a little bit about acid rain. What happens for industrial processes is they produce sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide and then as a result when that is combined and goes through some chemical reactions in the air it produces sulfur sulfuric acid and nitric acid these acids become part of the evaporation precipitation cycle you have higher amounts of sulfuric acid and nitric acid or higher amounts of acid rain and areas of the world where there's a lot more factories. So for example, in New Jersey, there's this whole strip where there's just tons of factories in New Jersey and they have real high rates of acid rain. 
and they can see that in buildings where you have like sandstone, which we have a lot of that in the Chicagoland area where there's these beautiful ornate carvings, it looks like this. That, that gets burned away over time. But for you and I, so like if you're in this area of New Jersey and it's raining and, it, and you don't feel like, ah, they burned my acid. It doesn't have that effect on you because the acid levels are small enough that we can't feel them. But the decomposers and the detritivores who are smaller organisms and where that rain is falling to, that amount of acid can increase on the soil and have an effect on them. Now, if we get rid of the DMDs, who's going to recycle waste and dead things? You're gonna have an issue because they play such an important role in ecosystems. So here, definitely, we're talking about keystone species that with the elimination of them, you're not having the recycling happen. The other kind of whammy about this is that when you have acidic water, it also grabs onto or bonds to lead, mercury, aluminum, heavy metals. Heavy metals over time can lead to poison in organisms, which is biological magnification. This term is going to be something I want you to think about in lab today, is that as owls who are very high in the trophic pyramid, they're getting all of the toxins of everybody below them. So kind of reflect back on that area when we talked in the trophic levels at the end of it about biomagnification for lab today. So here you can see a researcher who's studying acid rain in an area where, like for example, the New Jersey area, trees, they're not even brown. The bark layer gets burnt off over time. You can see here too, the trees are kind of like a mottled color, but they're really white. And that's because over time, the bark layer can get burnt off. Bark is really important in trees for the transport of sugars that are made through photosynthesis in the leaves, so that if the sugars aren't being transported down, they're not getting nutrients down through the trees, and the trees, you can see, they look pretty barren there, that the trees start dying, because they're not getting their nutrients able to be spread throughout the tree. So we're gonna talk about some of the different biospheres, uh, excuse me, biomes in the biosphere. The biosphere is like the biggest part of ecology. We're talking about the entire earth. That's the biosphere. So all of the ecosystems on the earth. When we're talking about individual ecosystems, we will call them biomes. So we see biosphere, right? The sphere, the earth is the biosphere, has living things on it. And the ecosystems are biomes or areas that have specific living and non-living things where they interact with one another. The study of the way living things interact with their non-living components is called, in a specific area, is called biogeography. There's bio again. So if you're studying the geography in relationship with the living things, geography and bio, the non-living portions, the abiotic and the biotic together in a specific area. Sometimes this falls under like more earth science and sometimes it falls under ecology. So we have you know, a, lot of, a lot of these professionals, and we'll talk about a few other careers in ecology and what ecologists do, but someone who's a biogeographer may be an ecologist in training or they may be more like an earth science person. Depends on if they're, they're more, their studies focus more on the living components of where they're looking at or the non-living components. So the biomes of the earth, we have a lot of diversity of biomes. We have things that we look at when we're studying a biome as we look at environmental factors, especially weather 
and climate. If you don't know the difference between weather and climate, climate is like year round. So we could say our climate has four seasons. But our weather today is going to be 86 degrees and sunny. Weather is a daily thing, climate's a long term thing. In relationship with weather and climate, one of the things that we also look at specifically in each biome are what plant communities live there. So an ecologist might go to an area and be like, oh, that specific plant lives here, so I'm going to classify this ecosystem or biome as this. So why do we focus on plants? Because they can't get up and move. They're subject to the climate and weather and they can't really do much about it. This is a plant called the silver sword. It's found on an extinct volcano in Hawaii. And it's the only place in the world it's found. So these are the biomes that we have in North America. You can see just in North America, we have quite a diversity of biomes, but this is a the only biomes, or these aren't the only biomes that exist in the world. There are others as well. And even this is very general, that in this picture, they just kind of put all the biomes, everything in the world into these nine biomes, but there's a lot more than this. So like for example, in Africa, they have savanna and tropical shrub forest. We don't have those in North America. Also, sometimes with the biomes, um, they forget about water areas, that water areas have very specific living and non-living thing interactions, so they might not consider like a wetland area in those charts that you just saw before. And remember that ecosystems are going to be limited by the amount of energy that can be brought into the ecosystem and the amount of nutrients that can be recycled. The most diverse ecosystems, two of the two of the most diverse, not the most, but two of the most diverse ecosystems, we do have them in North America, are the tropical rainforest and coral reefs. We typically find these about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. So we get a little bit of like coral reefs and rainforests into definitely Mexico, a little bit of the characteristics of a rainforest in Florida, but we have a little coral reef in Florida, some in Mexico, definitely Central America that we see these as we get closer to the equator, they become more robust or more common. Coral reefs are in decline. There's a lot of different reasons. Coral reefs get this kind of double thing with climate change is that the water is getting warmer. And the other thing is that carbon dioxide can be absorbed into water higher than it can stay in air. And so the absorption of carbon dioxide is causing acidification to happen in water. And so what happens with coral reefs is that now they're fighting two things. It's getting warmer and it's getting more acidic. And with living things, we know that we only exist in small ranges of temperature as well as acidity. So those two things can be very, very fine in their effects. A lot more humans going to coral reefs to see them, kicking them, standing on them. They're not being used properly. And then the corals are fighting all different kinds of diseases, that there's many diseases that people are studying. We're gonna take a look at the other major ecosystems in North America. So desert. Desert you might think of like this, or even like more like a lot more sand, not even this picture. But there are short growing periods. They might get, um, some rain for a week, and one week can cause this explosion of different kinds of flowering and plant reproduction. So deserts are very, very dry, 
they usually get less than 10 inches of water a year. If they get too much water at one time, it can be very destructive, especially if there's tons of people that go to one area to listen to music. And it could be like, just turn into mud for days. If the people weren't there, like Burning Man, if you heard about that over the weekend, that um, people were stuck out there in the desert because they got this mass amount of rain at once, and that's normal for those areas, but when you have people there, they can't deal with vehicles and things like that to get in and out. Ironic is that they had to, police had to crash through a like, climate activist barricade that they were stopping traffic going into Burning Man. They called like a 10 mile backup uh -huh. and cops just came in and like blasted through. So they let people go in even though knowing yeah. it was flooding? Like, well, no, no, this was before flooding and all that. Like climate right. activists had stopped the traffic from going to the Burning Man site. And then after the cops took care of them, got rid of barricades and people started flood, uh, going into it, then the rain happened. Yeah. So it's kind of just ironic. Yeah, right. But they, they were like, things can happen, right? And we don't belong there. So that was clearly, they probably felt like, kind of, like, it's almost like a. They felt justified, probably. They were probably like, yay, we were right. You know, it's like, you're right, but sometimes it's not fun to be right. Thanks for adding that. The animals in these areas are usually colored like sand, and they're active at night when it's a little bit cooler. So their eyes, you can see, like this kangaroo mouse has a really big eye because the only light that they might get at night is the moon, and so their eyes are trying to absorb as much light as possible, so they get really big eyes. Deserts are very close to the, kind of like just above the equator, and then even for further south. So kind of interesting that you have these southern areas that are called deserts, but maybe a little bit cooler because um, some of the characteristics of like certain plant species only getting X amount of water a year qualify in different areas. Grasslands, this is very common in our area where all of our farmland is now but we do have some still natural areas. We haven't called them prairies. You might call it a prairie grassland. That you have a lot of grass, and then you'll have a tree every so often here and there. Sorry. Uh, summers are very hot. You can tell our area, right? It's very hot in the summer. Could have frequent droughts. The other thing that can happen is at the end of the summer, when you have less rain, and lightning would strike, this is kind of more natural, that it would cause fires to happen. And the combination of the fire with the drought in that area has led to the evolution of plants that have very deep roots. So that when you have a fire that blows through, native species, native to the prairie grassland, their roots will survive underground far from the fire and they can regrow the next growing season. So it makes for like usually end of summer, these natural wildfires would leave good conditions of you burn all the top stuff off, leaves all those nutrients in the ground. You have the fall, winter, and spring comes, and in the spring, the more water and the nutrients allow those deep roots to regrow those plants. So kind of an interesting evolution that happens. You have a lot of insect species that rely on the flowers that grow in these areas. And you also have some mammals and larger animals that are common. If it was more natural and less farmlands, we would have buffalo or bison walking around. If you're, if you're like, oh, I'd love to see the bison, you can go out to Fermi land. It's not, it's like probably a good, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. And they have a protected area where they have bison. It's a, it's a neat little place to visit. And then you've got all kinds of other, um, like natural chickens, fox, wolves, skulls, skunks, bobcats used to be here. Every so often one pops up and people are like, oh my gosh, like, well, they used to live here. Snakes, a lot of different kinds of snakes and then smaller animals as well. And antelope, we don't have antelope anymore. Um, another characteristic of our area, temperate deciduous forest. 
You can see around the Great Lakes, very common, and down through the East Coast. A lot of dense trees. Seasonal, that you have the trees that will lose their leaves in the fall and go dormant to survive the cold winters. And you have a variety of animal types and especially a lot of migrant animals come through here. And we don't have, you know, and more so in the mountains, the black bears have tried to stay away from people, so we don't see them in our area anymore, which is fine with me because they scare me. And then you have these small areas of temperate rainforest where it's a little bit chillier. Or you're looking at areas where you have the ocean and mountains. And so up into like Alaska and Canada and the west coast of the United States, it's very, very, very lush. There's a lot of evaporation and precipitation in these areas, but it's a little bit cooler. So it looks like a tropical rainforest with a lot of like mosses hanging. If we go further north, you have the northern coniferous forest, which is a lot of your pine tree areas. That's most characteristic. And then even further north, you have the Tiega, and we're talking really, really cold places far north. The winters are very harsh. Again, a lot of evergreen trees, so your pine trees are characteristic. You don't have a lot of diversity of plants or other species. And the most, most of the mammals that are there are, most of the animals that are there are mammals. And these are big lumber sources where we get a lot of our wood from. You are seeing a lot of these areas in terms of lumber that they're um, focusing on a lot of more sustainable practices. And I think that that was driven by economics, that if they just like took a mountain and they wiped out all of the pine trees, that it wouldn't leave very good conditions to regrow them. So now what, um, so they would just be left with this barren land. What a lot of companies are doing that sell lumber is that they'll like take in an area, they'll take like one tree and leave five trees. And then they'll go to another small area and take one for every five. And so that they're kind of like picking through and leaving conditions stable behind. But I think that's more money driven than anything. And then if you go very, very, very far north, you have the tundra, which is mostly like this, which caters to animals that are more white colored. Like you've got the um, snowy owl, and you've got the arctic fox, polar bears. They have short growing seasons. It may warm up a little bit, but you don't see trees. So you can notice here there's no tree growth because there's what's called permafrost, that the ground stays permanently frozen. So trees, their roots can't be supported by that. Temperatures can get down to negative 40 degrees. We have some friends who live up in Alaska um, who for like two months, they don't go outside. So here's another picture that again, ignores the water areas. That's always, as me, I'm a water person. I'm like, what about the water? There's biomes there too. So these are the kind of general map of the land biomes. 